Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Asset Business Insights webinar, and thank you for being here with us today. My name is Ian Ong, and I am the Alumni Relations Manager for Asset Asia Pacific. I would now like to introduce our speaker for today, who is Dr. Francis Go, Venture Builder at ING Bank NV Singapore. He will be speaking on the topic titled, Reinventing Financial Services Through Innovation in the Post-COVID Era. Should you have any questions they'd like to ask the speaker, please ask them via the chat group. We will try our best to answer them during the Q&A session. Without further ado, I shall now pass the mic over to Dr. Francis. Thank you, Ian. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we wish that you had uh, really had a good lunch and uh, thank you for your time today. I'd uh, like to speak on the topic of uh, the future of uh, financial services and I term it as reinventing financial services through innovation, which is extremely important uh, topic that I'm close to my heart. Now, um, I understand that most of you are undergraduates uh, either in the uh, BBA program or the MBA program, uh, and there are some alumni as well. Um, I'd like to deliver um, my uh, chat around three themes. First of all, um, is the observations that I have and uh, on these financial services, how it has changed in recent times. Uh, we can have a very good Q&A later on. I think I'm sure there's a lot of views on that. Uh, secondly, um, with the changes, it comes with new norm. And uh, uh, not to mention the most apparent one, today we talk about the new norm due to the COVID crisis has caused us uh, on a lifestyle wise and in, in, in many ways adapting to a new norm. Then uh, finally, uh, then how do you uh, prepare yourself better? Because uh, most of you will have a career at least for 20 to 30 years ahead from now. Now just a bit about myself uh, before I start because it's really a personal story and journey that I take on. I started my journey in my career uh, as an engineer uh, with ExxonMobil. Um, it's been a very good six years there. Uh, it was a very good program, not sure they have it today which is a uh, management trainee program, and uh, basically a job a year, somewhere around the world, of, uh, pretty much of your choice. And, and that, that forms a, a foundation of the, our understanding of the business and the sector in the industry to help us prepare us better uh, in 10 years time where we, we uh, groom to be a, a, a senior manager of the uh, organization. Uh, however, at the end of the year, six, seven years when I finished my MBA, just like many of you, or just, uh, just graduated, I uh, wanted to, uh, like some of you, not all, uh, wanted to be a, a management consultant. So um, uh, among the choices that I had, I uh, finally picked uh, Accenture, uh, which I joined as a strategy consultant, basically um, doing a lot of strat work before uh, the IT sets in. And uh, as an Accenture is an IT firm, I, uh, I stayed on uh, and, and went into the commercial side of it. And I decided that I needed to have some, other than consulting, I needed to have some uh, business development sales uh, experience on. Um, and then uh, there on, I went on a couple of sales roles and uh, gradually went into a management role uh, in the couple of uh, IT companies. And I took a, a switch uh, at the end of the 20 year journey and I joined a consul HR consulting firm at Mercer. Uh, as a leading the HR and because I believe the people factor is extremely important. And then, um, and I'm in the last, uh, so after, after 25 years of my career, I am now in financial services, which is a exciting, which I'm, I'm gonna talk a lot more later in the next 20 minutes, uh, what I've observed, what has changed and what is so important and why uh, many of us, uh, you don't have to be, have a banking uh, training or accountancy or business or, or banking related subjects but actually you can still have a career in any sector that you want. But that is also part of the new norm. Now there was a recent article I just picked up. This is very fresh. I think it was not, I think it was last, just last week. Um, it was a Harvard lecture. Some of you may have seen it on LinkedIn that the Harvard lecturer says that no specific skills will get you ahead in the future, except uh, the way of thinking. Now, of course, uh, we, we know that attitude has been a long time. People say, well, you have the right attitude, you, you, get, you, get, a, you get a job and you get a lot of opportunities. But besides attitude, uh, which is very important, the way of thinking is extremely important these days too. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about what, what, what way of thinking or what are my view, the way of thinking that is important. Um, many of you are trained in a functional training, uh, accountancy or a, a business uh, subject, a topic. 
you have a very strong functional experience and our training. But uh, what is more important these days is the T-shape, as you heard of the T-shape career, T-shape employee, where, and some even have a pie shape, which is the horizontal is what it will lead you, important, uh, lead you more far more importantly to be a management in the future. The vertical is the specific skill sets uh, that you have earned along the way in the degree or the diplomas that you have. So the T shape or the pie shape, and the, what I want to feature uh, and focus on is on the horizontal, which is far more important because that is give you the ability to take a, a side a view of a more broader view of how solutions are formatted form, uh, and formulated and how, uh, so, uh, how, how new uh, ideas are also formed. Now, um, the world is extremely connected. I want to highlight a few things that we observed in the last 10 years. Um, Right from the left, you see, uh, I call it the fabric of internet. Now, since the internet has been and come on stream, it has been a fundamental fabric that connects everyone, everything. So therefore, information uh, information is king, to say, right? You know, information actually costs and value much more than money. Internet has allowed us to transverse uh, across the world at an instant, instantaneous, uh, you know, time zone that allows that 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 uh, inform uh, that that knowledge. Uh, to be transmitted and that itself uh, creates a lot of efficiency, efficiency and uh, roll on to the impact on uh, the, the, uh, the workflow. Uh, and, and, and very recently this year, right, we see the coronavirus uh, and, a and, and, and a pandemic like this has actually not just riding on the internet at all, but riding and, and just, just reinforcing how connected we are in the world. Uh, that you know, somebody would say that you will never come to my continent or you would, you know, when I come to my country, uh, with the connected world, you know, uh, it's almost impossible. So um, uh, that that's that virus uh, and the pandemic situation has also exposed the weakness of supply chain. Uh, even though you know, you think about it, more than twenty years or thirty years of solid supply chain uh, formulations, consultants, framework uh, are instituted. And many have a lot of plans, and you know, really having a great supply chains uh, uh, to prevent any kind of a mishap. But what we saw was a supply chain total breakdown. Particularly, one of the areas was manufacturing. And take for example, steel. Uh, China produced fifty percent of the world uh, steel. Iron ore have been processed there, and and with the shutdown in China, it the roll on impact is great, and we can see that that is something that's not easily uh, mitigated because. A lot of people, even though they want to have a secondary uh, or third supply chain, uh, it's still difficult to mitigate against the cost pressures or the, uh, or the efficiency of how some of the, the, the preferred supply lines are being uh, instituted in the first place. So extremely, this is a well, well, very well connected world we're living in. Now, most laws uh, since for many years now, I think uh, is at least, uh, particularly in the 60s, 70s, people say that, you know, is it, it will be forever because every two years, every two years the uh, you know the, the transistors, the speed of the transistors are uh, double every two years. Um, there's some views that right now that what you know they, they has reached a plateau, but I don't think so because uh, the transistors age is is over. In fact, uh, right now uh, we're talking about quantum computing, right? Quantum computing is something that uh, it transfers beyond the speed uh, of of light uh, in sense that. Uh, how electronics are being uh, manufactured today, uh, even the whole um, the whole regime of the of the connectivity is is fundamentally being challenged, and what is really impact is on the speed and change. So therefore, with the technology that's often driven by technology as an underlying power underneath, uh, that really propel further the changes. Um, I want to discuss a few mega trends that will impact uh, the financial sector a bit more today. Although the, generally these financial, these mega trends, they do uh, impact across all industry. First of all, on the left is mobility, where uh, you, uh, the, the, the concept of mobility allows anyone to do anything anywhere on their palm. Um, and today, today is a handheld device. Okay, in future it might not be. It could be a, 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 a part of your glasses, which which the technology has been there. It's just a business viability did not take that on further. So, so having the ability to access information services on your palm anywhere, anytime on the go, is, is what the term mobility. 
And that's a very underlying uh, important that customers like you and me are look for, like take for example, maps, banking services, uh, payment, everything is all on the palm. Um, now on the right hand side, you see that the uh, propelled by digital, the social media is uh, taking on much, much bigger way that we've ever seen. Uh, not to mention that all of you have seen, have your experience, your own, how social media has actually caught some people um, in a way that uh, they, they, they got surprised, you know, uh, their career got cut short, uh, you know, being captured on, 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 on video, unfortunately, and being shared on social media. And we also see, you know, uh, more the darker side of social media, mm -hmm. which is often, you know, been really uh, been a focus to take off, uh, have to, not having them that channel, terrorism, for example, uh, suicide, for example, all the dark sides of the, of the social uh, issues uh, has been propelled also by social media. But no, so with the right governance and framework, uh, social media by right can do a lot of good. Uh, take for example, how you, a brand uh, is able to bring on a lot of businesses in Singapore or anywhere has been forced to shut down, uh, at least on the, on the retail. The only way that they can really want to propel their business is through online. And social media has been for a long time, has been one of the medium and channels for them to do it. Now, the mega trends as we go is also, I'm going to talk a bit more about uh, 5G, uh, particularly it's, it's really coming to on stream very soon. You know, it, it, trials has been already been done in many countries. Um, it, it, what it offers us is a fantastic uh, speed, uh, a level of speed that we can get on our phone. And that really propel a different way of how we transmit information and how we really uh, get things done. So the technology, this 5G is really a, a, it's just one segment of the telco enabling, but this five enabling us for better lives, both on the personal side, but also on the, um, also on the business side, because a lot of the IOT, um, you know, the infrastructures, robotics are all driven on, uh, on the 5G network in the future. And, and, and today with the limitation of 4G, it, a lot of that are not being used widely or the efficiency is not there because of the speed. But in a very short two years and next five, 10 years, you will see that, that 5G would undertake uh, us, our world and manufacturing world in a whole new way. Now, uh, the trade war is gonna stay, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it's gonna stay for a long time. Uh, with the rise of uh, you know, China in terms of the both political and, uh, and both in the economic uh, stage, in you know, on the economy stage, uh, they're bound to be this, this rivalry, which we have seen for centuries, right? Um, but we believe that the coexisting of superpowers, uh, they do exist and they have to, with the balance, right, sex balance eventually. And, but, but however, during the intermit intermittent or uh, in the transition of the, the balance, and, and the balance is volatile, it never stays the same. It will create a lot of disruptions uh, to the surrounding economies, not just politically, but a lot of it commercially and eventually hits us on the lifestyle as well. Um, drivers that propel the, they bring us closer to home on the financial services industry is uh, payment. And uh, we look at it right now, and most interesting you have noticed in Singapore, for example, there has been, in fact, still ongoing, all right? They're going to open up, uh, there are 21 bidders uh, for the retail banking license and the wholesale banking licenses. Uh, we have 14 bidders for wholesale, uh, I think seven, yeah, seven uh, bidding for the retail. But what's interesting is this, the applicants for the licenses, both wholesale and retail, are not traditionally from financial sector. Uh, there are names like uh, Xiaomi, uh, they are like Singtel, uh, Grab, uh, Venture Funds, it is obvious. Uh, even telcos and, um, and, and every, every uh, you can see that the proliferation of that across sectors has been, a, this has been far more visible these days. So payment is a central core or other financial uh, services is a central core for any commerce, e-commerce or commerce transactions underlying the fundamentals, right? So therefore the right strategy for a lot of the, uh, take, the take the story of Grab, for example, they have started as a car sharing business and eventually today, uh, you know, they joke that they just happen to own a split of cars. That's it, that's not the core even anymore. It's really the commerce and um, the, the, the payment business that is really uh, going to transform uh, and really transforming Grab today. And so as many companies and many organizations. So you don't see, you don't see 
uh, companies traditionally say on their, in their own sectors anymore. In fact, they evolve, particularly those uh, newer companies that have existed in the last 10 years. Uh, they could start out in one industry and then later on you can see them proliferating into many industries and booming and very well, uh, well, well, good, good performance through us the, towards, the, uh, towards the last few years. Um, I talk about the, uh, in how they evolve from 1G to 5G just now. Um, and just want to make a point here that um, what underlies this uh, propel of 5G and in future 6G, which will in the time to come uh, in the much shorter segments from here is the technology. And the technology's layer that is what we talk about is, um, let me tell you a quick story that, that let you see how it has moved. Now, uh, there was, when I was, almost 20 years ago, I was walking down the halls of uh, TSMC and the UMCs. Those guys are today still the giants of the, the wafer plants. And even at that time, 20 years ago, uh, the wafer fab uh, um, technology was already so advanced. I remember we're talking about um, 12 layers, uh, 12 layers within the, uh, the, the, the thickness of your hair. Imagine there's 12 layers there and transistor layers going through. Um, and each layers are being laid upon, built upon, and it just, you just, you can't imagine, you can't see with the naked eye actually, uh, how the, you know, this has transversed the ability of this, uh, transistors, transistors has evolved. And now with quantum computing, technology is leapfrogging. Okay. And then you, you, you know about machine learning, um, you know, deep learning, uh, and they're taking a whole new way of looking a, a taking, uh, computing from a neuron, uh, perspective that today you will be able to train a machine to be able to learn or, and, and balance and manage billions of scenarios to provide the outcome uh, that you want. Staying on, on, on uh, financial services now, that's why I mentioned that I, I, I said the new norm, uh, how do we overcome the new norm by many of the institutions is through innovation. And as this graph that I uh, picked up from McKinsey, uh, you can see that it's important that uh, they are Started, of course, with data, foundations, decisions, and design distribution. Now, this is really a cycle, a workflow that how people will transform, but can transform unstructured data, particularly. Structured data has been exist a long time, but even managing structured data has been a challenge of many, many, many organizations. However, the unstructured data, which means data exists in different shapes of form into data crumbs, uh, social media, news, everywhere, they, each of them, if they were to assemble in the right form, in the right way, they really will form very good information that can be used for ins as insights, and then the insights can be transferred and used for strategies built. So innovation has to start from, uh, and we look at this, uh, starting from data, availability of data, quality of data, and, uh, and then how you design the system around that. And, and once you have that, how do you even distribute that? insights information to make commercial sense. So this is a very good um, uh, workflow as I see a graph that shows um, that from data to distribution by McKinsey to understand how that people can capture the end-to-end -end, uh, uh, you know, personalization growth factory. Yeah. Now, um, bringing closer to today's uh, time that we have is COVID-19, uh, what is an impact? And, and I picked up this very recent Accenture uh, snapshot on how it has impacted the industry. Uh, you can see here credit management, revenue compressions is, is, is really a big thing for across all industry. I don't think there's any industry that not get impacted. Some are even impacted positive way, you know, the healthcare, uh, the medicines, uh, masks, for example, uh, sanitizers, uh, you know, these are also impacted, but in the positive way. Um, but, you know, 80-20 rules, I guess 80% of, of the world are still being, uh, you know, being, have a revenue compression situation, at least for the next two years. And look at airlines, for example. Airline is going through mm -hmm. a, not a two-year, but a five-year, because based on the GFC, uh, Global Financial Crisis in 2008, it took on average five years for the, for the airline industry to recover back. And if you think about it, the current uh, crisis that we face today is much more severe than the global financial crisis in 2008. And if it took five years then, how long would you take? My one view of thought is that it would take longer, but I have a different view that it might not take that long. Why? It's the same reason why the speed of change has accelerated and the speed of change has, in fact, um, has, and, and the, the, the cycle has got so much shorter 
people, more organizations have, has become more agile. Now the agility that is brought on could potentially not make, uh, not have the airlines suffer the same severity of having a five year recovery. We'll wait and see. Customer service and advice provision. Now, people are at home, well, you know, there's, there's less and less of face-to-face -face, uh, interactions with customers. The whole new framework and the mindset of uh, delivering customer service is, is, is new. And a lot of people have gone from a traditional, more traditional sense of getting services now to online. The customers are also changing their mindset as well. And finally, uh, operating model, adjustment, cost control, and innovation. Now, the only way an organization can evolve is continuously invest in innovation. Because innovation is the only way that you can transform where you, how you work today, who you are as an organization, uh, and as a department, as a person, to take advantage of the change, take advantage of the new norm, evolve a new way of working, workflow, products, services, you name it. And at the end, what you achieve, you achieve success, that you have a strong stake, you have a strong position in the marketplace, and therefore you enjoy the fruits of your labor as a person or as an organization. Now look at this uh, model from Deloitte I picked up, um, and it's not too long ago, 2017, uh, the past banking, many of us and many of you have used the services from, from, from the bank. You call a call center, if, if, if you drop a credit card, you go online, apply your credit cards, you, you do transfer banking mobile and uh, you receive your statements and you, you know, sign some forms. The future is this in 2017 based in Deloitte, but I tend to disagree because the branch is a old concept. And in fact, Singapore has actually experimented with the branchless uh, concept and even some of them have even transformed. And you look at one of the example in DBS in uh, Plaza Singapura on the basement too, I believe. They have transformed the branch is, is, is into a, like a cafe lifestyle view where you walked in, you never, you never imagined that could be a, a, a branch, look and feel like a branch anymore. Uh, this is one way of transformation of a branch. Another way is that why do you even want to have a branch if you can do without that? And as you know, real estate and human factors costs are very high to run a branch. Another thing is this, right? Uh, call center, I mean, they, they still exist and they will continue to exist at least for a while, but I believe that the community or the customers has evolved such a way that I myself don't like and I hate call, hate, like, I hate to call it call center. It, you know, you ask to press buttons and over buttons mm -hmm. and listen to series and series of instructions. Uh, it's not for me. Uh, I want to get things done. I want to get things done like now. Um, most of the time it's done online and even the online, the sophistication of how the journey, customer journey online has to be evolved that I can get the service done. I can get what I want almost as soon as, as instantaneous or as soon as possible. Calling a call, calling call center, it will be only a really at the last resort. Mail. Um, I don't know about you. I have stopped receiving mails for anything, almost everything. Uh, from utility to telco to anything. I, 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 I don't really remember that I need to open my letterbox anymore, except for, um, for, for government stuff where it still comes through the mail. But what I mean is, if you're given a choice, I don't need a mailbox. My mailbox is on my phone, it's on my palm, uh, in my emails. You know, it gets to me whenever I want, when I want. And, and not having to open a letterbox and keep copies of that. So you can see in three years, in just less than three years, uh, this graph, uh, this chart from Deloitte is really outdated. And you can imagine that, that any charts that comes up, they will continue to evolve the model of banking and, and other industries. Now, I, I love this uh, tagline, uh, uh, live more, bank less. You know, if a bank tell you, you know, bank less with us, it's interesting. Just like a car say, hey, drive less. You know, it, it's, it's, you, may, you, may, you may think that, oh, wow, it's interesting. Why, why they ask us to bank less? Don't they want us to bank more so that they make more out of us? Actually, it's on, on the contrary, it's not because they want you to live more and that means having more time of your life, uh, doing what you want and spending less time doing banking stuff and really leave the banking stuff to them. And what they're, what they're trying to say is customer experience come first. So they will deliver the services that you need what you need to get things done on uh, for banking services at the most convenient uh, uh, way 
and such that you spend a lot less time doing banking yourself. So therefore you bank less. So customer service experience is a big, big, big hot topic that I, I do a lot of uh, consulting for my client, for my work, but we won't be going into detail today, but it's really centered around the entire experience that governs how on the, on the back end and front end of your organization, how you think, how you do your work, how your workflow and how your operations, everything fundamentally should start from how the customers experiencing you. It's no longer the day that you set up your company, your workflow structure and the customers follow the process. Oh, you tell the customers what to do, seven steps, get this done. Today, the customers tell you how many steps they can tolerate. If it's two steps, you make it work. If you don't make it work, your competitors will make it work and you're out of business. Now I'm going to end uh, my uh, talk with just three little tips that I have today. Um, the, that will center around, maybe give you uh, some thoughts and maybe uh, uh, questions. These are formulated based on uh, the 25 years I've uh, seen and, and more increasingly last couple of years I've been coaching leaders. Now we all know what VUCA world is, right? And uh, be, be very clear that you got to be very comfortable with the VUCA world, the new norm that is the world is volatile, everything's volatile, right? Uh, it's uncertain, complex, and very ambiguous. Now, it's gonna get more vocal. Now, on your side, you, either you're a leader today or you ambition to become a leader soon. Uh, these are the four uh, things that, that really well positioned with the same syllabus of VOCA, which I want to leave you with is, you gotta set a vision for yourself, uh, for your, what you do, very clear on that and there's a clarity there that make sure that you're clear and the understanding is not just clear the vision but also clear on the, on the surrounding who and what you are doing and finally one of my favorite is agility it's having the ability to be agile now agile is not being flex it's flexible and just change whatever is needed all right I'm, I'm very agile you think that you can change anytime uh is 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 agility is not that that that, that could be uh, uh uh maybe flexibility but agility is the ability to, to understand what's to come, prepare for it, understand why, and able to formulate a way, a, a thoughtful way to make the tweak and adjustment. And sometimes the agility doesn't need to be 180 degrees. Sometimes it's just one degree. But that makes a lot of difference. It's one degree over a longer distance, as you can see, it's going to be very, very big impact. The second one is about integrity. Uh, I'd like to leave with you is um, have a mindset or follow through on what you say and you're going to do follow through and follow on do what you say and say what you do now this is extremely important um, now in order to have it engraved into what you do uh, in, into your workplace and to how you behave at work you should start this on your everyday life as part of your personal uh, personal uh, the way you carry yourself in everything in everything and whoever you engages have this uh, part of your life and then you don't have to think it's become your second nature and this will win you a lot of great credibility that they will, will, will formulate and build trust upon you and which is trust is often the foundations of relationships and, and sometimes and pretty often I would say the foundation of business relationships and how people and businesses and organizations are transversing with one another. Now, finally, uh, in your career, I wish you all well in your career in your events along, uh, but I want to remind you perhaps one thing is that you are in the competition with no one but yourself. The reason why I say that is that uh, I do observe a lot of young people, uh, particularly I would say, uh, they, they, in, in the pursuit of, uh, of everything good and great, which in terms of their career, uh, they, 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 they may have uh, sidestepped some, I mean, some certain maybe focus on the humane elements of uh, or the surrounding, being less sensitive to people around. Uh, and then, and then uh, and, and exhibited and behave in a way that uh, may not be that desirable. So I was also to remind uh, you that you, you will be a better self for yourself to, in the future when you do and desire to be better than who you are. And, and this constant, this rule will actually propel you much further because there's no limit to where you can get. That only way and the final destination is where you realize that uh, um, you, have, you don't need anything to make you happy anymore. Now with that, I uh, thank you for your time. I, I think I keep to the time at 30 minutes, which is fantastic, which is my, my target. And I'll leave a good 30 minutes for questions and answer. Ian, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Francis. I mean, it's a really nice presentation. I got actually some questions uh, that we actually have. I'll start actually with two of my own first. 
actually the first question I have is about call centers and banks. I mean, uh, everyone has actually encountered the situation whereby, you know, you're waiting online and you're waiting uh, so long actually for the person to get back to you, uh, you know, when you actually call a call center. I mean, when you're talking about innovation in banks, uh, in your own opinion, what do you think will actually replace the call center uh, and actually get back uh, for the banks to actually provide a better or faster response to customers? Okay, so um, to, to, to be fair to the banks, they have really started uh, almost a decade ago, uh, like 10 years, uh, to look at replacing the call centers with much more efficient customer experience. For example, um, uh, they have moved, for example, a lot of the inquiries into email where they will get back and they don't have the customers that don't need to be holding on the, on the phone. Uh, they use a lot of internet, uh, uh, you know, uh, processes to able to process uh, some of these services. But the, the over the last more recent five years, they are starting to use AI, um, artificial intelligence, intelligence to able to understand those questions, having the NLP ability, uh, ling uh, natural linguistic processing ability to understand the questions, and able to reply. Uh, based on the machine learning that the, the, the robot, robots understand based on the context of question and giving the answers. Now, the preliminary uh, robotics and the, uh, the we call the chatbots that we experience are not that advanced where they're sometimes giving us answer that's not so refined and very standard. Uh, but we still see that there's been a continuation of improvement of the technology, such a point that the answers are much more, uh, the robots have been trained to be understand and the difference between uh, two questions, even how the questions are phrased and how the words have been arranged. So that, that, that continuously, the AI will eventually take over the uh, a lot of the back office, the uh, uh, services. Like I can just give the numbers. Um, some of the Indians uh, SI are really replacing, helping customers to replace their call centers at the ratio of one to six. So they can reduce six times the number of call service agents within two years with AI uh, and, and, and giving better improved uh, customer service experience. Well, the next question I actually have is actually you talked about 5G technology and how do you think actually 5G technology can best actually benefit the banking and finance industry? Oh, um, okay. The fundamental of the difference uh, of 5G versus the current is the speed. All right. Now the speed is really, uh, it can go up to a hundred times if, you, if the infrastructure is being built uh, well uh, for that. Um, so the so the transmittance of uh, a lot of time when we do uh, banking services, uh, one of the basic uh, requirement is the validation or, or authenticity of the person of the of the account holder. So uh, now they have been you try experimenting with voice, but increasingly uh, they will be using video, which uh, and video and uh, you know video analytics today AI is really rec able to recognize and differentiate all the. Uh, seven, eight billion people we have around the world uh, to the to within minutes, my need of a second. So, so with video technology coming to authentic, authentic for, for the authenticity purpose, five uh, G technology will transmit that in a much uh, quicker, more efficient way. Now, over large volume today, in a, in a single instance, it's easy, but I'm talking about over very, very large volume. Well, this question that I have uh, is actually this: because you come from uh, HR background. How do you think banks need to change their hiring models and principles to meet uh, the Balkan world? That's an interesting one. You know, uh, that's a very good question. I tradition. Okay, I'm going to compare with how banks traditionally has higher. They often look at the functional expertise first, uh, and then uh, then they look at the uh, the uh, HR side, the talent, the talent expertise, um, and then they look at the culture fit. Uh, however, increasingly, banks, uh, the automation and the, um, the, the moving of the services, uh, I like to mention earlier, from branches out and into really everything online, that they, first of all, the number of hires uh, is it's going to be uh, significantly lower. The second, the second thing is that uh, as, as, banks, as banks going into, like some people joke that bank and IT is really, really merging, which is, which is actually true, mm -hmm. but it's been all around because bank is propelled by technology, right? So the hot jobs in the banks in the future is not those bankers, investment bankers that I, I dealt a lot with uh, recently. It's, it's, it's actually the technologists, the coders, you'd be surprised, the, the people who are great in having, you're able to build AI and machine learning languages, able to build the next generation innovative platforms. 
these are the people that the banks will need. They will, meet, they will need less and less of the traditional bankers, front office managers. Why? Because they can be, it can, it can be, they can be replaced by machines. Today, you know that uh, they call, they, you know, they, even in RM, is able to be uh, replaced by uh, sophisticated, sophisticated robotics to able to pro uh, provide advice, advisory, robot advisory has been around for at least five years. And some of the startups that are doing robot advisory has been doing very well. Uh, for the non so not too sophisticated investors, those are good enough. So uh, RMs are RMs are one of the jobs that will be that will be gone, and it's a very high paying job today. Uh, but there will be a few remaining for for other purposes, not so much of the web advisory piece, but much more on the relationship piece, where that 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 you can that if the robotics have not been able to replace in the future, which I think they will, they will still come in and play the human and the human to human H uh, to H uh, interaction. Mm -hmm. Now, on this note, Francis, I just, I just want to actually ask you as well. I mean, you talked just now about AI. Uh, do you think AI can actually really uh, replace, uh, you know, our apps actually, especially for the high net worth individuals? Okay, now, uh, it's a, there's a long answer and a short answer to that. Now, I'll give you my view. My, my short answer is yes, but uh, provided there are some uh, scenarios, okay? So uh, generically, the, the RMs does a lot of functions, okay? There are certain functions that they do today can be easily and have already been replaced by AI. Um, okay, for example, uh, stock picks, for example, based on 20 years history of a certain performance and then using AI to predict the stock price next day, next month, uh, the machines are already doing that, okay? Uh, now, then you can put multiple layers of that complexities in, not just a stock, but stock in the market and then with different uh, forex and currencies and you just put in tons of, uh, tens of thousands of even parameters, the machine can handle that, but human cannot handle that. And the human will take a lot of time to, you know, to, to, to compute that kind of uh, parameters and scenarios. Now that machines do better than humans, and then that, that should be left out for, for what the RMs will do in the short term, uh, they will have to manage the executives, which is on the business side, the customers are still humans. They like to be talking to someone. Uh, interacting with someone and, and, there's, and, and there's, there's a multi-million dollar deal at stake. They want to be really have the assurance and the trust, the trust with, with Yen. Like for example, I know you, I've been dealing with you, I trust you, therefore I'll continue to do business with you. Now that element of the human type, the, the RMs will, will, will still have to play the key role. Nice. Okay, I got one last question here uh, from our participants. How do you think the collapse of Wirecard will impact the fintech segment and growth of non-banking players in the financial services? How will it impact? No, I would say that the impact is very little. Uh, let me explain why. Now, it doesn't surprise me this Wirecard uh, episode. It doesn't surprise me at all. In fact, it, 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 the only thing it surprised me is why it takes so long to get caught. <laughs> okay, so um, as, okay, in general, as everything uh, moving online and, and on the, every transactions, every financial transaction and transactions uh, based on one and zeros on the fundamentals, all right? So, so although you can have a lot of compliance layers and ring fence it with a lot of uh, technology, uh, firewalls and uh, preventions, uh, it, there will still be a way around it, you know, meaning that uh, that's why patches of software has always been continuously been done and, and hackers are getting more sophisticated and no system is unhackable. That's why you know that even the CIA, when they come up with a certain uh, programs or patch, they will invite the best of the hackers to come and hack themselves and get a prize because they want to know the known unknowns and they don't want to be in a position of unknown unknowns. So um, impact is very little because that is going to continue. I mean, the next Wirecard incident could come next month, next year. I, I don't know, it could come in a smaller fashion than this two billion, I think was, uh, was the CEO's investigation. But, there, there, will be, there will be tons of fraud as you can know. The fraud is one okay, fraud is one of the key and top issues the banking industry is is facing and will continue to face in a big way. And it's one of the key focus of where the spend is, the prevention of fraud. Uh, but it's also big money for a lot of startups because that is an, an endless way because uh, there's no wall that is uh, unbreakable, so to speak, in a sense. So there will be there will be business to be done, money to be made for people who can could build new solutions, uh, new ring fence, and there'll be money to be made for people who are trying to break it. Okay, so this actually ends our Q and A session and concludes the end of our webinar. I'd like to actually thank uh, Dr. Francis for taking the time out to speak on this topic. Really appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice and great day ahead. Thank, thank you. Bye bye.